In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul said, This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came with that purpose in mind, to meet us in our need with salvation, to extend to us grace, to answer the problem of sin in our lives with hope, and to, to deliver us into a relationship with him. And as we take communion, that is exactly what we remember about Jesus Christ, our Savior, his willingness to save us when we needed him most. So this morning, I would encourage you to take a piece of bread and share together in the act of communion as we allow this piece of bread to remind us of the body of Jesus that was broken on the cross. And we take the cup and allow the juice to remind us of the blood of Christ that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And remember him as we drink together. Please join me in prayer. God, I thank you for knowing our need and being willing to meet us there. That because you love us so much, you sent Jesus to save us, to extend grace to us, and to bring us into a relationship. We are so grateful, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'd like to also encourage you to continue worshiping with tithes, gifts, and offerings. If you'd like to do that, you can follow the link on our website to our online giving platform. You can mail a check into the church. Or you can also use our text to give service. In our new sermon series, we'll study the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, giving him encouragement and guidance as he stepped forward to lead the church at Ephesus. Now, these letters have special significance to me. In college, we used Paul's writing as course materials. We learned about what it, what it was to, to, stu- to train for ministry and to prepare for ministry. As a young minister, I read these letters and the letter to Titus as if Paul were writing to me. And the words that he wrote to these young men gave me strength and encouragement and confidence to serve the kingdom and to lead the church where I served. Today, we're going to use these words from Paul to realize As we gather together as a church, what our conduct, our relationships, and our worship should be. Let's begin reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. If you have a Bible and you want to turn and read with me, you're welcome to do that. The words will be on the screen. And if you want to use the YouVersion app, you can open up the app and search under events for Parkview Finley and find scripture and sermon notes there. Paul began with an introduction to his letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul began by identifying himself as the author of the letter. And what we realize in this opening is that there's an established relationship between Paul and Timothy. And we look back into the book of Acts, chapter 16, we see where that relationship began. As Paul traveled around establishing churches, he came to the city of Lystra, where he met a young disciple named Timothy, whose mother was a Jew and father was a Greek, and yet he was known around the area for his strong faith. And his reputation preceded him. Paul took him along with him on his journeys as he invested in the life of this young man, teaching him about leadership and about faith. And Paul continued in his ministry, giving Timothy opportunity to serve and to lead, of delegating tasks to him, and sometimes even leaving Timothy behind to continue working with a church while Paul moved on to the next city. 
Paul and Timothy had spent considerable time together in Ephesus already before Paul wrote these letters, before Timothy came back to serve and to lead and to guide the church. In fact, through the book of Acts, we see that Paul spent two years in Ephesus establishing the group of believers there, preaching the gospel, drawing people to the Lord and building them up in their faith. And his success was significant. It was so well known, in fact, that he the, that the, a riot started in Ephesus because the temple of Artemis, there was a cult there worshiping her, the artisans who built the idols of Artemis were threatened by this growing movement and their revenue was down significantly because of all the people coming to know Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior. And they were responsible for the riot, trying to drive Paul out of Ephesus. Now, Paul also wrote a letter to the Ephesians, guiding them and instructing them. This was prior to Timothy coming back to work with them. But we learn a great deal about the city, about the believers there, and about their faith through that letter to the Ephesians. When we look to the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, First and Second Timothy, Second Timothy was written by Paul from prison. First Timothy was written by Paul while he was still traveling, after he sent Timothy there. And while we have less information about the end of Paul's life, we can read through the beginning part of his journeys and understand the process, understand his travels as we read through the book of Acts and see the connection of those events to the instructions that he's giving in his letters. As he began this letter, Paul identified himself as the author, apostle, obedient to the command of God and Jesus. Now, as an apostle, that means that Paul was sent out with the message of truth about Jesus Christ to declare in the world. And Paul was obedient to that role, to that command that he was given. He preached the gospel. And he was obedient to this command as he devoted his life, willingly submitted to the gospel call. He established churches that would continue to preach the gospel in the places where they were. He appointed leaders in those churches to take care of the churches. He trained up young men to continue preaching the gospel and building churches, guiding them and instructing them in the way of the Lord. Paul pointed to the fact that this was a command given to him by God and Jesus Christ. And this acknowledged the fact that Paul hadn't claimed this authority on his own, but he was given authority to lead and to proclaim the gospel of truth. And it's authority that he handed down, empowering those who would serve in roles of leadership. And it's authority that he extended to Timothy as he stepped forward to lead the church in Ephesus. Notice the names that Paul attributed to God and Jesus. He called God our Savior and Jesus Christ our hope. Now, it's mostly in the Old Testament where we read about God as Savior, as his people recognized his deliverance, his salvation from adversity, from captivity. In the New Testament, we read about Jesus as our Savior. But what we recognize is that salvation comes to us from God through Jesus Christ. It was God's love that motivated him to send Jesus into the world. And Jesus is our hope because he was willing to come into the world to save sinners, to lay down his life, extending to us the possibility of relationship in him. Paul addressed his letter to Timothy, who was like a son to him, even referring to him as Paul's true son in the faith. In his introduction, Paul wished grace, mercy, and peace on Timothy from the Lord. And then he continued with more instructions in verse 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Now, Paul warned Timothy about false teaching and he reinforced the truth. And this was the real problem that Timothy was facing in the church in Ephesus that needed to be addressed. There were teachers teaching false doctrine who were devoted to myths and endless genealogies instead of the truth of the gospel. The result that was being 
produced in the church was, was controversy and speculation. And all of these conversations, all of these teaching were distracting the believers from the truth about God. Now, you may have noticed how easy it is for our conversations to be driven by things other than the truth of the gospel. Even when we gather together as believers, we talk about current events. We talk about our opinions. We talk about the things that we think are happening in the world and the current events and that are going to be happening in the future. And it's easy to be so distracted by the things that we want to talk about and sharing our opinions that we talk more about those things than we do love and grace in Jesus Christ. It's because there's an urgency in voicing our opinions about current events because they're not going to be current. There's a desire for us to make our opinions known, to have a conversation, to prove ourselves right. And the result is that very often we create distraction among the believers who gather together. We create even division when our opinions conflict with other people. The solution that Paul pointed Timothy to bring about in the church in Ephesus was to focus on advancing God's work by faith. And this solution is effective today as well. When we stand united by our focus on faith and advancing the gospel, our opinions are placed in the proper context. They're still important to us, but they become secondary to the kingdom, to the work of the gospel. And they can be held for another time when casual conversation will help us build relationships. When we forget about the work of the kingdom, we lose perspective and urgency of the truth of the gospel. And we lose sight of the reason that we gather together as a body of believers, as a family here in one place. And it's easy to lose sight of the significance of the gathered church to worship on Sunday mornings. And we begin to think about what we gain from being here at church together instead of how we can serve and how we can participate in the kingdom and advance the gospel. So Paul wrote these words to Timothy to guide the believers in Ephesus because he truly loved them and he truly cared for their spiritual well-being. He wanted the believers to be able to grow and to mature in Christ. And so he told Timothy that the command was driven by love, a love that would produce a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. And a love that came from those qualities, a pure heart that was driven by proper motives of wanting to serve the kingdom and to advance the gospel. A good conscience that was the product of right decisions, of knowing that they were doing the right thing. A sincere faith that was a genuine expression of a relationship with the Lord. Now, false teaching is damaging to the church. It's devastating to those who hear it and are led down a wrong road. Now, Paul pointed to the damage that was being done by the false teaching in Ephesus about the myths that were being taught, the the controversies that were coming up, the speculation that was taking place, and the, the distraction from what's important. Paul also pointed to the damage that was being done in the hearts of those who were teaching, that they were teaching out of a desire to obtain the status and recognition that went with teaching, but they lacked the pure heart, good conscience, and sincerity of faith. Paul said that they desired to be teachers of the law. And that's a, a name that we, you might recall from the Gospels of the Jewish leaders. And their conduct toward Jesus, their conflict with him, reflected the fact that they had an insincere faith and a love for authority. And so while teachers will help their students gain knowledge and information, what will usually happen in teaching is that they will also pass on their way of thinking as well and reproduce their thought process in their disciples. And as these teachers were presenting false doctrine with wrong motives, the result was that meaningless talk, strong affirmations that came more from personal pride than undeniable truth. Paul wanted to point Timothy to address those problems and bring about a resolution within the church at Ephesus. Paul continued his guidance to Timothy with some clear instruction as we continue reading in verse 8. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, murderers, 
for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Paul pointed to the importance of moral boundaries. This is the purpose of the law. And Paul was clear that the law listed in the Old Testament from the first five books of the Bible had this purpose. It contained clear guidance for God's people and how they should live, what was allowed and not allowed. He also stated that the proper use of the law is for people to recognize what is right and what is wrong, to draw a line between what falls within God's moral boundaries and what falls outside of God's moral boundaries so that people can eliminate sinful behavior. That's how the law should be properly used. But let's take a closer look at what Paul said for our own understanding. The law is meant to identify sin and keep God's people within his moral boundaries. It is useful for those outside of the boundaries of God's moral law to recognize what sin is so that they can stop doing it. It tells us nothing about forgiveness. It tells us nothing about the guilt that comes from those actions outside of God's moral boundaries. The law was not made for the righteous. It was not meant to produce growth and maturity in those who belong to the Lord and who are doing right. And so then we have to ask ourselves, which category do we fall in? Do we fall in the category of the righteous who are living faithfully devoted to the law or do we fall in the category of the lawbreakers who are living in sin. Paul made it clear about who belonged in which category. But what about Christian people who are striving toward righteousness but fail? Who aren't living as lawbreakers and yet they struggle with sin? Is there a middle ground where most of us would find ourselves and identify? We don't seem to fit in either of these categories. In the book of James, the brother of Jesus talked about what it is to be a lawbreaker. He said, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, the law will not help us develop a mature relationship with the Lord, but it will help us to recognize sin and eliminate it. The law was meant to bring people into an awareness of obedience so that they could develop habits that would point them toward faithfulness. It's the gospel that points us to the means of salvation, forgiveness, and grace. And when we step into the moral boundaries of God's law, then we can devote ourselves to spiritual disciplines, growing in the Lord and drawing closer to him. Now, the danger of having a clear line drawn between lawbreakers and righteous is that we're tempted to believe that we cannot develop a relationship with Christ if we're still struggling with sin, but we can. We have to understand how. It, sin separates from us from God. It drives a wedge in our relationship with him. It hinders the depth and effectiveness of our faith in him. But we do not need to be rid of sin completely before we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Only he can forgive sin. Only he can provide the strength that we need to move into his moral boundaries. The growth, true growth, will begin to happen in our lives when we're no longer committed to sin, but instead are developing our faith in the Lord. And we have to understand the difference between willfully, deliberately living in sin and trying to be faithful and falling short of our desire to live in faithful obedience. Sin in our life, the sins of our lives must be repented of and dealt with. They're not excused but overcoming them is part of our growth toward maturity as we learn to allow the Lord to overcome them in our lives. And we learn what it is to live in grace and repentance as we draw, draw closer to the Lord. Paul continued his instructions in verse 12. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength 
that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Here, Paul illustrated the importance of grace. And he illustrated it by using himself as an example, highlighting the experiences of his own life and the mercy and grace of the Lord. He expressed gratitude for the calling of the Lord in his life. He recognized the sinfulness of his past and the mercy that he experienced in Christ. It was an outpouring of grace recognized in faith and love. And here's his conclusion. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He said it's a trustworthy saying that should be accepted by all. Christ is motivated by his love for us. And that love extends to us when we need it, when we can't call ourselves righteous. It meets us when we would absolutely identify as lawbreakers. And it's through the sacrifice of Jesus that we, like Paul, can find a new identity in Christ, that we can be carried from a life of sinfulness into a life lived in relationship with Jesus, a new life that can only be provided by him. And Paul expressed his gratitude in words that honor God, king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God who deserves honor and glory eternally. Our praise of God should demonstrate our understanding of who he is, of his character and quality, the fact that he reigns forever from before time began to beyond the end of time, God rules and reigns. He is immortal. And his body will not decay. We will not see a change in him. He is everlasting. He is invisible. And while we can't see him, we know that he is there. We feel his presence and we see evidence of his power. He is the only God. There is no other. And he deserves honor and glory eternally. And so while we praise him according to who he is, we cannot be limited by who we are in our praise of God. We cannot be limited by our understanding. And we cannot be limited by the way we think about life and our relationship with the Lord. And we have a a tendency to compartmentalize life. And that tendency extends to our faith. We come to church on Sunday morning and we lift the name of God high and it's a wonderful experience. And then we go to lunch and then we go home and do some chores and we get ready for work on Monday and we leave that praise and worship of God where it belongs in that compartment on Sunday morning. Unless we happen to be doing a devotion or listening to Christian radio or worship song. And we give God our hearts for that time until we move on to something else. And our worship of God is finite instead of eternal. When we give God glory and honor forever and ever, we live in that relationship with him. He is always on our mind. We are praying without ceasing, talking to God about the events of our day, both good and bad, surrendering them to the Lord so that he can work in us and work through us. We're lifting up praises as we do the things that we're doing. And we live in the hope and expectation of an eternal relationship with the Lord, where we will keep on giving him glory and honor forever. Paul's words continue in verse 18. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now, Paul encouraged Timothy to hold on to his faith and good conscience. These words are the product of Paul's experience and his love for Timothy. Loving parents help their children recognize their full potential, and they guide their children to accomplish that potential. Mentors work the same way. They, they use their relationship with other people to help them recognize their full potential and push them toward achieving that full potential in their lives. Paul was both to Timothy, 
He called Timothy his true son in the faith, and we see the value of that relationship. Paul was a mentor to Timothy, guiding him and pushing him to accomplish his full potential in the Lord. These two men were very close. They shared a strong personal relationship together that grew through their travels, through their work in the church. Paul taught Timothy, encouraged him, guided him, prodded him, cared for him, and pushed this young man to reach his potential. I've had the benefit of having several very strong mentors in my life. One of them, a man named Jerry Paul, was the minister that I worked with in my very first ministry in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Jerry and his wife, Pat, proved to my wife and I that they truly cared about us, that it was more than a working relationship that we had together, that they valued us. I respect Jerry a great deal still to this day because of his wisdom, his heart for the Lord, and the fact that he chose to mentor me very specifically, investing in my life through our relationship and helping me, pushing me beyond where I was comfortable, pushing beyond my current capacity so that I could grow to serve the kingdom by accomplishing the potential that God had placed in my life. Jerry is still a presence in my life. He continues to encourage me and guide me. He's come to visit a couple of times. The, the first time he came to Finley for a visit, we went out to eat together. And we spent that time during that meal talking about life and faith and work in the church. And Jerry pushed me and challenged me in the ministry that I'm doing here at Parkview. Jerry and Pat planned to come and visit on a Sunday morning to participate with us in worship. But that night after dinner, they came to our house and Jerry fell and broke his arm. And so late Saturday night, I drove them to the hospital and then I drove them back to their hotel. And because of his injury, he was unable to, to be here with us in worship. And he was unable to hear me preach that something that he had been looking forward to. In the years that I spent serving with Jerry, he never heard me preach because every time I filled the pulpit was because he was on vacation or out of town. And then the 13, 14 years in between, he hadn't had the opportunity to do that either. And I received an email from Jerry just recently that said, Pat and I attended Parkview online this weekend because of the coronavirus and putting our sermons online, he had the opportunity to finally hear me preach after years and years. And in that email, he challenged me, he encouraged me. He wrote words that he knew would help guide me and stretch me to achieve my full potential. And I am so grateful for his wisdom. I'm so grateful for his encouragement. I'm so grateful for the truth that he speaks into my life through our relationship. That's a true mentor. Someone who is willing to build relationships beyond their definition, who's respected and valued, and who cares enough to continually push and point toward full potential that God has placed in my life. Being mentored is also a responsibility. It means that I have to be willing to build relationships, to look at the people in my life and open up the doors of my heart and be vulnerable with them and allow them access to who I really am. It means I have to look for attributes in the people around me. I have to look for reasons to respect them, and I have to give them room to speak truth into my life. Now, we rarely do that in our relationships today. We rarely give people that kind of access. We rarely trust their voice enough to allow their, the truth that they have to speak to us to bring about change, to push us toward something more that might make us uncomfortable but we have to respect them enough and trust them enough to know that they have our good in mind, that they're pointing us to reach our full potential so that we can be mentored by them. That's what Paul did for Timothy, and that's what we need to do in our lives, in our relationships. Instead of standing on our pride and choosing to believe our own opinions, to trust the instruction that God is providing through strong mentors in our life as we open up our lives to them. Notice the similarity in the instructions that Paul gave to Timothy from what he wrote earlier in this chapter. This description of what Paul was trying to accomplish through the command, through the love, is what he said he saw already in Timothy and wanted to make sure that he held on to. A pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith is what Paul wrote about. And he said, Timothy, I want you to hold on to your good conscience and your faith in the Lord. 
It would be Timothy's example that would help the believers there in Ephesus grow toward maturity. And Paul said these very powerful words, I want you to fight the battle well, holding on to your faith and holding on to your good conscience. Paul's desire was for Timothy to grow from his work, to not use his labor in the church as an excuse. And Paul had examples of those who refused to follow the guidelines that he provided. The devastation that came to them personally because of their failures, because of their choices. And Paul pointed out Hymenaeus and Alexander as those who had failed. And Paul said, I turned them over to Satan so that they could learn from their mistakes. Now, most likely Paul meant by this that he had not allowed them to participate in the gathering of believers, that he would set them aside and not allow them to worship together until they had recognized the error of their ways and come back to repentance and willingness to be led and guided by the Lord. And Paul's instructions for Timothy were a safeguard in his life to hold on to his faith and his good conscience. We don't always think about faith like that, though, as something that we need to hold on to. If you've ever been to an amusement park, you'll notice that before you step on a ride or a roller coaster, there are signs posted everywhere about securing your valuables so that you can hold on to them. There are announcements made over the sound system about placing your phone and your sunglasses and your hat in a secure bin or putting them deep in your pockets so that they, you, they won't be lost while you're on the ride. Now, these things are a normal part of life. We get used to having them with us and on us, and we forget that they can so easily put, be pulled by wind, by gravity, by centrifugal force out of our hands while we are on the ride. And so we have all these warnings before we sit down. They should make the same kinds of warnings for us in life before we get out of bed every morning that remind us every day before we face the roller coaster of life that we need to hold tightly to the things that we value, that we want to continue to be a part of our lives. We need to hold tightly to our faith and make a decision to secure it so that we don't lose sight of it. If we're actively living our, our faith, if we're not actively living our faith, it will slide out of our grip. If we don't embrace our faith, if we don't secure it in our lives, culture will rip it out of our hands. If we are distracted by the things of this world and reach for the pleasures of life, we'll let go of our faith in order to grab hold of them. It's imagery that we need to keep in mind so that our relationship with the Lord will be continually a part of our lives. We don't always think of it that way. When we first accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we, we recognize the imagery of taking hold of that relationship, of receiving the gift of grace, of accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But we don't always think about that same imagery when it comes to living lives of faith, that we need to hold on to our faith, to secure it so that it remains a part of us. And yet we, we very much should view our faith that way as something that we need to actively make a decision to hold on to so that it will have significance moment by moment, day by day, throughout our entire lives. And that's the challenge that we face from scripture that we're reading today, to take hold of faith and allow it to continually be present in our lives. And this morning, I want to challenge you with that thought that if you've never taken hold of if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you would choose to do so today, that by believing in him, having faith that he forgives sins, that you would confess him as Lord and Savior and repent, be baptized in his name, and make a decision to take hold of the grace that he extends, to take hold of the relationship that he has made possible and surrender your life to him. And for those of you who are Christians, that you would choose today to secure your faith in your life, to hold on to your, your sincere faith and good conscience, that you would willfully choose to live out your faith actively every day so that it is a part of you, that you would find opportunities to share the love of God with the people around you, that you would live wholeheartedly devoted to the moral boundaries of God in your life, that you would recognize how meaningful it is to grow in your relationship and draw closer to the Lord day by day. Would you please join me in prayer?
God, I thank you for the encouragement and guidance that you provide us through your word. That while these words are written for Timothy as he led the church in Ephesus, they mean so much to us today. God, I pray that you continue to help us understand how we can grow in our relationship with you, how we can hold our faith close and yet still express it and extend it to the world around us, living it out each and every day. God, we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.